morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Kara Odom Walker. I'm the Cabinet Secretary for the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services. I'm joined today by Dr. Richard Henderson, an OBGYN and past president of the Medical Society of Delaware, and Eugene Young, president and CEO of the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League. We're here today to talk about an important thing, awareness and outreach to the Black community in Delaware and the impact that COVID-19 is having on this population group. Let me start first with what we know. As of Tuesday, April 14th, we have lost 43 Delawareans to COVID-19. By race, 70% of those deaths have been white individuals, 23% in involved individuals who are black, and 7% are residents who are Hispanic. We know that individuals at the highest risk for COVID-19 are seniors, especially those 65 and older, and individuals with chronic health conditions, such as hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, asthma, and other lung diseases. As a practicing physician, Dr. Henderson and I know that African Americans have a disproportionate rate for many of those chronic diseases. And coupled with a lack of access to health insurance and health care, the risk for exposure to COVID-19 can increase dramatically. Now, a little bit more on our testing data. Last week, Dr. Rattay talked about our incomplete data when it comes to race. Among our positive cases, race was unknown for 45% of the individuals. For 55% of the cases we do know the race for, about 44% are black, 43% are white, and 13% are listed as other. We have a lot more work to do. And we know that this is a concern for Governor Carney, for me, and for Dr. Rate, because blacks make up 23% of the state's population but 44% of the positive COVID cases for which we have known race. The race and ethnicity data is submitted by a healthcare provider on the lab requisition form when someone is tested. The problem is about half the time, the provider did not submit that data or check it off when testing the patient. Here's what we're doing to fix this. Dr. Bate signed an emergency order last week requiring health providers to submit this information going forward. In addition, in order to fill in the missing data, our Division of Public Health has put in an agreement with the Delaware Health Information Network to help record the missing data. The DIN will then search its existing medical records for these patients and give us back records with complete race and ethnicity information. We will then add the missing records back to give us a more complete picture of the impact by race. But we have a lot more work to do to connect the dots. And as soon as we have a more complete picture, you have my word that we will share it with you and all Delawareans. We know that people of color face increased health risks due to economic, social circumstances, and other factors like implicit racial bias in healthcare. Nationally, we also know they're more likely to work in the service industry or be low wage workers than white people, which increases their exposure and puts them at a higher risk for contracting COVID-19. People of color are also more likely to live in locations and housing situations that put them at increased risk of infection because we know the virus spreads more quickly in densely populated urban settings and in high occupancy living arrangements. So we have a lot more work to do, but first I have to thank Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long, who was asked by Governor Carney to lead outreach to Black communities, which includes harnessing the efforts of DHSS, the Department of Labor, and many other state agencies, including ours. Second, I thank organizations like the Urban League, Delta Sigma Theta of Delaware Incorporated, IMAC, Network Delaware, the first state chapter of the National Medical Association, and the Divine Nine, just among a few, who are raising issues around data, testing availability, unemployment compensation, and equitable access to distance learning. As state government, we will continue to work to address those issues, and we will listen and act. What we ask of people who are tuning in is to share this critical health information. Lives are at risk. Our families are at risk. We know what we do today and tomorrow affects our grandparents, our mothers, our fathers, our children, and everyone else we love. We all need to act as if we already have COVID-19. So for more information, please go to Delaware.gov backslash coronavirus for information about how to access testing or call Delaware 211. In fact, you can actually use Delaware 211 to call whether you have a medical or a social need, um, things like food, transportation, and other services. 
So now I'm going to turn to my esteemed panelists. I'm really excited to do this virtually. We'll do our best to work through some questions and have dialogue. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Richard Henderson, OBGYN and former president of the Medical Society of Delaware. Thank you, Dr. Odom Walker. Um, as you've stated, we, what we know so far is that everyone's at risk for getting COVID-19, but there are some that are much higher risk. Those individuals who are 60 or 65 years of age or older who have chronic pre-existing medical conditions, as you mentioned, such as hypertension or high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes mellitus, obesity, asthma, or other chronic lung conditions, and those who have compromised immune systems, such as those who are living with AIDS and HIV. Each of these conditions, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, asthma, chronic lung conditions, and heart disease are very, very common in the black community, which means having a significant higher risk of both getting COVID-19 and suffering from the consequences of it, including dying, as Dr. Odom Walker mentioned. When we look at the African-American and black community, we see a large number of individuals in this age group who are either leading the family or at, at larger numbers uh, present in that family and who have one, two, or three of these major chronic conditions, which exposes them to increased risk for this infection and dying. That's why it's so very, very important that we in the Black community do two things. One is recognize what our risk factors are and who's at risk for having them and dying from it. And then number two, take the steps necessary to limit the spread of this condition, uh, this infection. Those conditions, those recommendations are the same as what you've heard before. Um, social distancing, as Dr. Odom Walker mentioned, practicing good hand washing and hygiene for at least 20 seconds and do it frequently. Avoid touching your face, hands, mouth, or touching your face, your eyes, your mouth with unwashed hands. And stay at home if you don't have to go out. Uh, if you do think you have mild symptoms, it's very important that you stay at home, contact your primary care physician or healthcare provider, and they will help guide you through what the next steps are and continue to be safe. Uh, these are the recommendations that I make for my patients who ask questions about um, COVID-19, and particularly as an OBGYN uh, uh, for those women who are pregnant, the, can, the recommendations are the same. Avoid known exposure and follow those same guidelines and recommendations uh, that the state and the CDC have put forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Henderson, and appreciate everything you're doing on the front lines, taking care of patients and being in the hospital. We greatly appreciate it. Please stay safe and look forward to the dialogue today. So now we'll hear from Eugene Young, President and CEO of the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League. Eugene. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Walker, and thank you, Dr. Henderson, um, for those um, great words of advice and counsel during this uh, time period uh, in our state and our country. Um, I would just like to just say for um, the Black community, um, one of the biggest things that we have to realize, and it's always been said that we know when America uh, gets a cold, uh, the Black community gets the flu. And that is essentially what we're dealing with right now. Um, I can tell you from a standpoint with me personally, you know, I had um, a close family member, an aunt of mine that actually was um, had went through and uh, suffered with COVID and was had, actually had to be rushed to the hospital um, and was hospitalized for a certain period of time. Um, family members of mine had to be um, to go along the process of being uh, uh, tested and, and checked and, and uh, various tests and things of that nature. Um, and one of the things I can say is um, this thing is very serious. Um, so please limit your contact, make sure you're quarantining in, um, make sure you're, you're sticking close to your home. Um, also, one of the things that we're very fortunate with in, in the state of Delaware, we oftentimes uh, joke about the fact that we're in such a uh, small state, but um, the day my mother was tested, um, an aunt of mine was tested in New York, and my mother received her results within 48 hours. Um, my other aunt had to wait almost three to four times as long in order to get um, to get any um, idea of what was what were her test results would show, um, and it showed that she did had has she has currently has COVID nineteen. So, um, so these are 
these are certain things that we're dealing with here, but I think that we can certainly get through them. But I think the, the key is to make sure that you're connected. Um, you can call into uh, your legislators, now is the time, call in, see what's going on, call into your council people, call into the governor's office, call into the secretary's office, see what's going on, see what information may be available that may be important for you and your families. Um, stay contacted with family, checking in on family. Um, that is, is vital at this point in time. And also um, just making sure that you're staying as healthy as, as possible, um, but recognizing the fact that we need you all to stay safe at this very moment. The Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League is focused around this idea that we have to engage with communities. So um, I think we'll talk about it later, but we're engaging with a lot of the different communities as to um, getting the word out. Um, but I think it's, it's just so important that we quarantine in um, because we are, as I said, when America gets the cold, we get the flu. Um, and this is like so, this is such a serious moment in time for us. So um, I thank you for being, uh, for allowing me to be on this panel. I look forward to the further discussion. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you for all that you're doing and your outreach. It's critically important right now. We've had a few questions come in and wanted to address those in order. Um, but as, as Eugene mentioned, please continue to let us know how we can respond to concerns. The first question is about where to access testing and whether the federally qualified health centers in our communities will be doing testing. So Westside Health Center is a critical part. Obviously, Lored, uh, Henrietta Johnson, we're all trying to come together and make sure that we have adequate testing for our communities. And I think this is a question that's come up several times right now. They are part of our testing collaborative. They are integrated um, into the conversations about testing access. We will continue to evolve and see where there are opportunities to increase locations. But right now, as, uh, as we've experienced, it's really important to make sure that if we have testing, we also have the capability to run the test, to have the supplies. And so right now, our FQHCs themselves are not actually running the test. They are a partner with the statewide collaborative where all of our hospitals have these uh, dedicated locations. Um, and, and it is possible that we that will change. So please continue to check our website uh, and see um, where you can access testing uh, that's closest to you and easy to access. Um, Dr. Henderson, um, uh, the, first, uh, the next question will go to you. What is your message to families who have loved ones who have chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, hypertension, or heart disease that put them at higher risk? Um, the, the, key, the first key is to understand or recognize that they have those uh, conditions and are at risk. So this is a good time to have some dialogue in the family. Say, Mom, Dad, I know you smoke. Do you have a lung condition? Um, pop, pop. Um, uh, do you have any of health issues that put you at risk? Because many of our family members may not actually know that our loved ones may have these conditions. And once you know they have those conditions and then um, follow the guidelines that have been recommended, the social distancing as much as possible. And we know, as you mentioned, Dr. Walker, how difficult that may be in the African-American community and our families because of housing situations but as much as possible, follow those guidelines. Practice the good hand washing. Um, wash your hands frequently. Uh, avoid contact with folks that are sick because you don't know if they have COVID-19 or not because of our level of testing is, is starting to improve, but we're not where we need to be yet. And if those folks are ill, um, try to avoid them um, as much as possible, but, but staying as connected as possible to other means, um, that, as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, uh, for yourself, uh, avoid your, touching your face with your, your unwashed hands and, and, and continue to follow what the guidelines are to help to maintain uh, good health. Um, it's a very anxious time for a lot of families and particularly the families that I see who the, where the young ladies are, are pregnant. And there are a lot of still a lot of unanswered questions about this, but so far the guidelines that have been put forward seem to be um, working and starting to flatten the curve. And so we continue to be vigilant and follow those guidelines. Uh, we will be taking a big step forward. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Eugene, could you talk about specific outreach to low income and minority communities in our state? 
Sure, uh, that is a great question. So um, one of the things that we're focusing on, I just actually um, getting off a call um, about this, um, we're doing everything from reaching out to people using social media um, and um, other ways of, you know, television, so on and so forth. But one of the things that we're really focusing on, focusing in on, is this idea that we need to meet people where they are. So actually, the previous call, one of the things that we're fo we're um, implementing is uh, um, door knockers, um, having people being able to go out to specific communities, not actually engage with people, but just put a door knocker on the door, which gives vital information about um, what's going on, um, what uh, potential assessments are coming to their communities, uh, what resources are coming. I know I spoke with um, a couple different offices and they're saying that, you know, there's more supplies that are coming They're trying to figure out how can we uh, disseminate them. So being able to say, here's um, supplies that are coming in or here's um, opportunities to get uh, an, ass an assessment. Um, and so being able to hand that out through door knockers, working with local community groups, um, actually finding people who have uh, loud, more, loud mouths or big voices in their community so they can get the word out. Um, I think that one of the beauty, the beauty about um, the black communities that were very close, um, especially being in a state like Delaware with less than a million people, so we're already close anyway. Um, but this allows for us, this, this idea of closeness allows for us to connect with one another, let each other know, check in on one another, say, here's opportunities that can help you, your family, the community um, for which you're in, um, because we're going to need to lean on um, one another during this tough time period. Thank you. So true. We definitely need to lean on each other. I, I have a question about um, reporting cases and deaths by zip code or census tract by race and ethnicity. I would say that um, DHSS is committed to making sure that we have information out that is accurate and useful and actionable. And that's why we've worked really hard to make sure we have information out about the number of positive cases by zip code. So you'll see on our website, the maps that are changing from a light um, color of red to darker shades as more and more cases. So you can see in your community where the um, high numbers of cases are and where we have virtual hotspots. We also wanna do that um, increasingly with information about the deaths and um, by race ethnicity. But right now, as I mentioned at the beginning, we don't have great um, race ethnicity data. We only have uh, data for about half. And I would say that uh, as someone who's looked at this information, it's also really important for us to caveat it because uh, someone checking a box on a lab form isn't exactly the same as asking someone what race and ethnicity do you, uh, do you do you associate yourself with? And sometimes people miscategorize, right? They just assume, oh, check the box white or check the box Latino or check the box, you know, whatever. I, I think that's really important. And for the black community, we know that that's a critical thing is making sure that people are able to self-identify. So we won't have perfect data because of that challenge, but we will have better data um, in the coming weeks. We're working really hard to connect the dots with the Delaware Health Information Network to get access to information with the hospitals, helping us uh, get better information to link to the lab reports. And once we have that, we will put it out. So um, appreciate. We may not be able to do it by census tract. Those are almost neighborhood level indicators. And once you get teeny tiny, we don't wanna release too much private information that this one person on the block is, is positive if they haven't um, given us permission to do so. And so that's a, a careful dance that we have to uh, figure out, but we do want to be able to release it as we have uh, more confidence in our information and as it's a large enough number to not um, disclose someone's information uh, in, a, in a privacy situation and, and make sure we're protecting what they would like released. So we'll, we'll keep having that dialogue. Please keep checking back and we'll put it out when we have it. Um, the next question is, is about uh, the risk factors that we know exist about low income communities and being more at risk because of environmental factors that are often in our neighborhoods based on where we work, where we live, you know, what puts you at risk for things like asthma and lung disease and other things. Is, is that a, becoming a challenge with COVID-19? I don't know, Eugene or Dr. Henderson, if you want to take a stab at that one. 
Uh, I'll just jump in real quick. I, I'm sure Dr. Hannon is going to have way more to say than I do. Um, a lot of vital information, but I would say absolutely. Um, one of the things that we we see in areas, like if you go to um, areas within the city of Wilmington, such as South Bridge, where you see um, industrial plant right next door to homes, um, you go to other areas um, up and down the state, you know, I think it was uh, Minkwindel, there's other communities that are dealing with this that increases levels of asthma, um, not being able to get fresh produce or, or proper uh, uh, live, have a healthy diet, um, not being connected to supermarkets. A lot of these things impact, um, it, it doubles and triples the effect of what's going on right now in, which we'll, in what we're seeing. So oftentimes, um, as Dr. Henderson said earlier, um, many of those people within our community with diabetes, hypertension, um, issues with um, their, their blood pressure, they're uh, more at risk and it is prevalent within our community. And so I think, as Dr. Henderson said, we need to connect with more individuals. We need to connect, reach out to people, make sure people are also reaching out with, uh, to their doctors. Um, with, my, with my aunt, one of the main things was that um, we pressed her to make sure she reached out to her uh, primary care physician. And it was her physician that said, you need to go to the hospital ASAP. And so um, please make sure that you're reaching out um, to these individuals that can, so that they can help you along in this uh, troubling and chaotic times that we live in um, and, and be able to make sure you get able to get the assessments and tests you need. Yeah. So I, I think that's very well said. Um, recognizing the importance of the other social determinants of health that were mentioned are, are critical because that's the environment that a lot of our citizens are uh, currently live and reside in. And so being able to recognize how those factors contributed, contribute to the health or the lack of health is, is very important. Um, there's, our, our families are, are the core of our communities. And so being able to be, stay connected with them as uh, Mr. Young just mentioned is critically important. And this, as I mentioned earlier, this is a good time for us to begin to explore what our family histories are, know what our risk factors are and begin to take the steps to uh, try to address some of those issues because this is just one isolated incident in time. This should be an opportunity for us to look forward and say, we need to start to prepare ourselves for what's gonna come next because this is not, it's, we're gonna get past this, but it's not gonna go away. And our community is gonna remain continually uh, disproportionately affected by this. And so this is a good opportunity for us to begin to take stock of that and to start uh, making plans to try and improve things for the future as, as much as we can as w with, with what's within our capabilities. And what we know about health disparities is certainly a, even more of a factor now. Those things that contribute to these differences in race ethnicity are just widening the gaps during this COVID-19 crisis, whether it's income levels, the ability to self-isolate, the ability to manage chronic conditions, those risk factors are putting our communities at greater risk and appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk through this, but it means we have more work to do. Um, I, I wanna um, give Dr. Henderson a chance again to just underscore what are those things that your patients are asking you about? What are they most worried about during your office visits with them? We know we've heard some information about pregnancy and and infant care, I, I don't know if you want to highlight anything that's really a, a been a burning concern for your patients lately. The, the burning concern, the question is, um, I'm pregnant, uh, does that increase my risk? Um, at this time, the data does not suggest that, but there are normal changes that occur in the body during pregnancy. Um, pregnancy has been, um, uh, considered a, a time when the immune system is compromised. Compromised is probably not the best word for it. It is certainly altered. Um, women who are pregnant have the same risk for infections uh, as women who are non-pregnant in the non-pregnant population. But when they do get an infection, uh, because of those changes that occur during pregnancy, the effects may be a little bit more uh, severe. And so the big question, one of the big questions is, am, am I at increased risk? And how would I know if I've been exposed? And, and will it affect my baby? All those are questions that are, uh, we're working towards to get the answers for at the moment. Um, uh, for women who are pregnant, um, most of the obstetricians are now in, um, discussing with 
those women when they what to expect when they come to the hospital because procedures have dr dramatically changed uh, because of the uh, infection rate uh, as to how many people can be with them during that during the time we're in labor where they're looking to have as much family support and support as possible and the hospital policies have changed those are things to talk about with your um, obstetrician or your midwife or, or whoever your obstetric providing your obstetric care is um, have a conversation with your uh, pediatrician uh, if you have a relationship with one already if you don't then when you come to the hospital those are questions that uh, a lot of uh, parents or new parents are asking uh, and and the the anxiety level that is there is because we don't have a lot of good answers for them at this time uh, and so following the recommendations that I, and I keep coming back to that 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 are out there now is the best that we can do for the moment and they seem to be having a positive effect in flattening the curve which means reducing the number of people who may be exposed and or have the condition uh, serious enough that they have to be admitted to a hospital um, and so in general we recommend that you try to remain as healthy as possible and um, of course avoid any known exposures but as you said Dr. Odom Walker any of us have may have it and not know it and so we behave as if everybody has it and we continue to practice those safe practices uh, that's a big step forward. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Eugene, we have just a minute left. I don't know if you want to offer any concluding uh, remarks before we uh, conclude today. Uh, I would just say um, stay vigilant, uh, stay strong, make sure you're quarantined in, um, check up on your family members. Um, just, just it's, this is going to be, a, 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 for me, I'm, for, for the Black community, this is going to be a long slug. And I think that we need to be prepared. Um, but also, uh, after this time, we need to make sure that we're at the front line, making sure that these issues um, do not put us even further behind once things, our economy, our state get back to where they need to be, that we make sure that we're um, fully engaged in advocating and talking about these issues that impact our community directly. So um, I thank you all for the work you're doing. Um, the, 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 thank all the doctors, the nurses out there. Um, Christiana Care, just say, you know, make sure my aunt was good. I'm, I'm thankful for every, everyone, uh, everything every, everyone is doing. Um, and I just wish you all the best. Um, and, and let's just stay, uh, stay fortified in this, in this journey. Thank you to you both. I wanna also thank Sarah Harrison for helping us connect the dots and outreach to the community. And for those of you who are working on this day in, day out, we need all of you right now. We need you to go and check in with seniors and make sure that they have access to groceries, that they can stay safe, that we can make sure we're pulling together at this time. We will get through this, but it does take all of us addressing the needs in our community and the rebuilding will, will need all of us as well to making sure that those economic factors are not widening those disparities even further. So we will continue to put out information uh, please do continue to reach out if you have concerns and needs. We continue to put um, updated statistics out and information about where to get tested, how to get access to care. And for, certainly if you have questions about providing services or need help, reach out. Uh, 211 is a great resource as well. So thank you so much for joining me, uh, both Dr. Henderson and Eugene, and thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walker.